trust you, we surrender our lives to you because you love us the way we were created to be loved. You've done for us what no one else can do. You saw us before we knew ourselves and you've loved us everlastingly. And Father, we are so grateful. And so we take these minutes and we use the words we know, the songs we have to sing. We give you the attention and the devotion of our hearts and we say thank you and you're awesome and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You all may be seated. A lot of people moved to Colorado for very noble reasons. The Lord called you or work sent you here. I moved to Colorado because I love to ski. And I grew up skiing all my life in New England on the hard pack. And then over spring break in college one year, a local to the area invited me to come home with them and ski for spring break. And I was like, wow, you can do it on snow. <laughs> like who knew? But I never went back and moved out here after school and met a girl and have stayed. Growing up skiing, I started by riding the ski bus, you know, to the local hill, which was fun until it wasn't. And then I wanted to go two hours north to the mountains of New Hampshire and Vermont. And I didn't have a way to get there. I was in middle school. And so my dad learned to ski at the age of 46. And being not far from that age myself now, only now does it really occur to me all the sacrifice involved in that. You know, I ski now and I've skied since I can remember, but still I'm like, I kind of feel it here and I feel it there and I sort of feel it there. And then you got to go to work the next day. My dad who was a pretty accomplished man. You know, he, he, he was a PhD and he was a, a, a successful, smart guy, was a beginner, like with the little kids doing pizza and, and, and then falling and having like yard sale wipeouts and spraining his wrist and thumping his head and then going to work the next day. He's like, I'm good, I'm fine, son. And only later in my life did it occur to me, why would my dad subject himself to that? And he told me, you know, it was easy. I just wanted to be with you. We're in Passion Week. This is the conclusion of it. And those of us who walk that road with Jesus, recognize acutely at this time in the year what Jesus endured, what he suffered, how he was misunderstood, mistreated, rejected, abandoned, betrayed, the injustice, the scorn, the mockery, the shame, and the agony of his death. And scripture tells us, and we know, Jesus was in very nature God. Everything was created through him. So why would he go through that? Why would he do that? Certainly he wouldn't have to, being God. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that we ought to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. He endured the cross. That's an apt description. It was a week of endurance to say the least. And it gives a glimpse as to the why. Why would Jesus go through? Why would he endure that indignity and loss? It teaches that it was for the joy set before him. The win was somewhere out there. Jesus saw the prize. Perhaps being in nature God, he could look ahead and it was for that long-term win that he endured this short-term misery. And so what's the joy? What was set before him that was so good, that was so amazing that it would be worth that? Like one of the passages teaches that... Um, he was given the name, right? The name that is above every name. You're like, well, that's awesome. But yeah, if I'm him, and granted my understanding is very limited, I'm like, hey, call me Frank forever and save me the whipping post. I'm good. Like, I don't know if the name alone is the win. Or it says that, you know, he got to sit down at the right hand of God and while unimaginably cool to be God's right hand man and to have a front row seat, I'd be like, hey, save me the cross and I'll sit back in the fifth row and I'm fine. 
with that? Can that be the win? Like his seating position? What was so joyful about the end game that it made this acceptable, even desirable? Like what did he get? You go through this and you get an all expenses paid vacation to Disney World or the French Riviera? You get courtside seats to the playoffs? Free Chick-fil-A for life? I mean, what would be, actually that would be pretty good. But what would be that joyful? Colossians chapter one teaches that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he's the head of the body, the church. This gives you a pretty stark portrait of Jesus' significance. A clearer and more comprehensive glimpse than perhaps anywhere else in Scripture as to who this man is. And all the starker the reality of what he did. It only deepens the question of why. It continues, He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to, him, to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. It was God's intent through Jesus to reconcile all things to himself. What does that mean? It means to make right, to take all that was wrong and put it to rights, to take all that was broken and put it back together, to take all that was lost and find it and restore it to its good factory design settings. To reconcile is to restore. It's very real to, to recreate, to redeem, and to make new. And it says Jesus was the firstborn from among the dead. Well, what is that talking about? I think it's talking about Easter. It's what we're celebrating today. Jesus died on the cross for your sins and mine, but he didn't stay in the grave. He rose from the dead, and that's what believers the world over are celebrating today. But Jesus, it says, was the firstborn from among the dead. His resurrection was the first of many resurrections. It was the first of much restoration. It was the first of total, comprehensive renewal. It's saying that God planned all along to restore his good creation, to reconcile it back to himself, to make it good, to put it to rights. And Jesus was the first installment Jesus' broken human body being made whole and new, prefigured, gave a glimpse of what God was preparing to do in all of us, in all of the world. His resurrection was like the green flag saying, go to God's good restoration work. Anglican Bishop N.T. Wright put it this way, precisely because creation is the work of God's love, Redemption is not something alien to the Creator, but rather something He will undertake with delight and glad self-giving. Redemption doesn't mean scrapping what's there and starting again from a clean slate, but rather liberating what has come to be enslaved. He continues, redemption is not simply making creation a little bit better, nor is it rescuing souls from an evil material world. It is instead the remaking of creation, having dealt with the evil that is defacing and distorting it. And it is accomplished by the same God, now known in Jesus Christ, through whom it was made in the first place. And he concludes this way, the gospel of Jesus Christ announces that what God did for Jesus at Easter, he will not only do for all those who are in Christ, but also for the entire cosmos. 
It will be an act of new creation. Parallel to and derived from the act of new creation when God raised Jesus from the dead. That's why Scripture teaches in Christ you are a new creation. Everything is being made new. In Ephesians chapter 1, this is the first century, one of the church founders writing to a new church community of young believers in Christ in the Turkish city of Ephesus. And he says, I'm praying for you. I pray that you'll get it. I yearn, I long for you to understand how great is God's power for those of us who believe. This isn't any run-of-the-mill power. This isn't merely heightened human power. This is the same mighty power that raised Jesus from the dead. What he's saying is, what happened in Jesus on his resurrection day is going to happen in all of us and in all of God's good creation. Jesus said, behold, I am making all things new. The problem is, I grew up in a religious tradition that said, or at least intimated, that God is fed up. He's had it up to here, and he's just about done with this place. Right? Like, he's about ready to scrap this thing. Forget them. He's maybe, he's going to like divert an asteroid field our way and send the earth to a fiery Armageddon and maybe like airlift out his handful of faithful to eke into heaven by the skin of our teeth. But friends, nothing could be further from the truth. God doesn't want to scrap his creation. He loves his creation. He created this world and called it good. John 3.16, famous for hanging on sheets and goalposts and on the batting gloves in World Series games and made famous by Billy Graham for 50 years, simply says, God so loves the world that he gave his one and only son. Why? Why did he give Jesus? Because God loves this world. And it goes on to say in verse 17, listen, he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Jesus endured the misery of his final week. He accepted the cross because of the joy set before him. And that joy is a good and perfect recreation of all that God made. That is a full circle coming. It's a redemption in total. And that begins and ends with you. You're the centerpiece. You're the masterpiece of God's creation. Think about it. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible teaches that God created the world bit by bit, sequentially. And after each portion, he said, it is good. And he created and said, it is good. And he created and said, it is good. And then he created humanity. And he said, it is very good. God's not looking to scrap his creation and start over. He wants to redeem it, restore it to its original design. And you're foremost among it. In Ephesians chapter 1, as you heard on Good Friday, Scripture declares God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And that's what we remember on Good Friday. But listen, it continues this way. This is what he wanted to do. It gave him great pleasure to do it. It's not like God couldn't find a better solution. All other hope was lost. So he came in with a last ditch effort at the last minute and was like, all right, already, I'll, I'll make it right for him. It's what he planned to do. It's what he wanted to do. Why? Because the word of God teaches he delights in every detail of your life. He cares about everything that's going on. He's like your mom in middle school. When you came home from school, how was your day? Good. Yeah, did you have anything fun happen? Uh, kind of. Did you, did you sit with any friends at lunch? Yeah. How, was there any girls? Did they talk to you? Were they nice? Were they pretty? Were they too pretty? Were they appropriately clothed? How was your science test? And like, it was okay. It was good. She wanted to know all the details of my life because she loved me. Jesus cares about you that much. He cares about every detail of your lives. The word of God says he has loved you with an everlasting love before you were conceived, before you were conscious. 
And long after this body goes back into the earth, he will love you. And that's the why. I have this dog, Hurley. He's a golden retriever. Anyone, golden retriever families or golden retriever people? I just absolutely love them. He has like, he has eight of the nine fruits of the spirit. He only lacks self-control, but I even give him a pass on that because he just, he's so excited to see me. He like freaks out every time I come home or like I'll go out for a, a jog and I'll come back and he's like, oh, it's you. I'm so excited to see you. How was your jog? And he like does laps around me and rubs up against my leg and does figure eights between them. And then I'll be like, I'll pat him on the head, but hardly pay attention because I got to, you know, change clothes, wolf down dinner, get a kid to practice. And so I'm upstairs. He runs up the stairs with me. He's like, hi, I like you. And then, and then I, I walk down the stairs and grab my dinner and he runs down the stairs next to me. Hi, I like you. And then I pat him on the head. I go out the door and get my car and he stands there looking through the glass going, hi, I like you. And Jesus is like that. Jesus loves to be with you. He longs to be with you. And when you've been apart from him, he's missed being with you. Getting to be with redeemed, restored you for all eternity, that's the win. See, that's the prize. That's the joy set before him. It's all of God's good creation restored with you as the masterpiece in the middle and getting to live eternally with you, knowing what's going on in your life, living in connection to you, that's the win. Jesus didn't have to do all that he did. He didn't have to go through the misery, the rejection, the agony, the suffering, the injustice, the betrayal. He didn't have to endure that. He did it willingly. He chose it because you're worth it. This was the path that he chose. He suffered by choice. He looked ahead and saw what was to come. Being in very nature God, clearly he could do that, right? And I think maybe he looked ahead and saw, hey, there's going to be a day where finally they're cheering for me. They lay their coats down on the road, in fact, when I ride into the city. They're waving palm branches for a minute or two because they think I'm someone else. They think I'm going to take over. I'm going to depose Caesar. I'm going to establish rule and reign for their people by force. And as soon as they realize I'm not that guy, they turn on me. And they start scoffing at me and they shout, crucify him. Jesus saw that ahead and he's like, bring it on, you're worth it. And he saw one of his companions who he broke bread with betraying him and he's like, bring it on, you're worth it. And he saw the mockery of justice that was that trial, the trumped up charges and the indignity of the mockery that followed. And he's like, bring it on, you're worth it. And he saw the whipping post and that whip with the pieces of broken pottery that would tear at his flesh. And he felt what that pain must feel like and he said, bring it on, you're worth it. And he saw the cross. He saw himself bleeding, his life ebbing away, alone with the shame and the agony. And he said, bring it on, you're worth it. You're the joy set before him. You're the prize. You're the big why. Jesus is crazy about you. He wants to be with you and he'd do anything for it. And so maybe you're like, okay, that's well and good, but why would he have to go through such awful suffering? If he's God, why not just be with me? Well, that is the question, isn't it? I would say precisely because he's God, that's problematic. See, in God, there is no darkness at all. He's all light. In God, there's no badness. He's all good. God and sin, they don't coexist. God, in his ultimate or perhaps penultimate act of love, chose to create you and me in his image over against all of the creation that lacked the consciousness and the volition to decide who I am, who I will be, what I think of you, and where I'm going to go with this life. And with our choice and our consciousness, sometimes too often we've chosen to go down a road that leads to a dark place. God cannot go there. God and darkness do not commingle. 
He's allowed us to go there. You're like, well, what love is that? Simple. From the beginning, God gave us the penultimate expression of love that is choice and then the ultimate expression of love, which is redemption. He said, I'm going to give you one final choice. Come back to me. I'll put everything to rights. You can't go too far. You can't break too much. You can't be damaged too far. So Jesus Christ died on a cross to pay the penalty that perfect justice required. And I can imagine some of you are thinking, well, how does that work exactly? Like, you've told me that I'm sinful and dark and can't exist with God. And you've told me that I'm loved everlastingly and delightful to God. Well, which is it? Either it's this or it's that. And I would say to you that it's kind of both. And I would like to explain to you a lot more about how that works, but we're near time for us to go. And this brings up a bit of a challenge, doesn't it? Uh, if we can just acknowledge sort of the elephant in the room. And that is that um, lots of people come to church on Easter, and I'm glad for it. Some of you start to tense up now and you're like, okay, this is the three minutes every year where the priest, preacher browbeats me or gives me the religious guilt trip. I've got no guilt for you. If, you're, if you come three times a week to church or if you come once a year, I'm glad you're here. You are welcome with us. Thank God for you and whatever he is doing in your life that is good. I'm for. So this isn't about what the church expects of you or pressure or guilt. It's about practical facts like the Bible is somewhat thick and faith is complex. And there are some questions that these truths raise in your mind that we're not going to be able to get to today. And this brings up the sort of conundrum of coming to church on Easter. And that is that you kind of hear the same story every year, right? I mean, slight variations on the theme, but he kind of rose from the dead every year. And we talk about how he's got good plans for you. Hey, this is Jesus' resurrection day. It could be your resurrection day too. You've probably heard it a few dozen times if this is your rhythm. And that's good. It's not bad. It's just that there's more to it. So you've, if you're not careful, it creates sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Like, well, yeah, but there's so much more. They just gloss over. Well, no, that's kind of what the other 51 weeks are for. You're like, well, how will next week be different? Uh, I mean, you probably wouldn't have to sit in a folding chair. I might not have a sport coat on. You know, but otherwise, we're going to worship God. We're going to talk about uh, practically and, and, and hopefully about what it means to receive God's love and live out of it. Live into the people he's created us to be, the good plans he has for our lives. Like, uh, you know, you don't have to scoff very long before getting to this point of scoffery. Like, yeah, but, you know, the religious people tell me that God created it in seven days. But, you know, we've kind of... Everyone else, except those people with their heads in the religious sand, have sort of acknowledged that radiocarbon dating exists and dinosaurs happened. And so, so there. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. But I would suggest that God's big enough for science. He thought of it. He created the laws of motion, the laws of thermodynamics and entropy. God thought of these long before humans discovered them and approximated their understanding. And he's happy for us to plumb the depths of his knowledge. He says, if you lack wisdom, cry out and I'll give it to you. But you may or may not get it in 22 minutes on Sunday if you come on Easter. So here's my, I've got two invitations for you. One is, I'd love to invite you back. Would you give me four weeks, not counting today. I get today for free, it's Easter. Like your mom made you go. This isn't on me, this is on your mom. But think about it. If your mom's gonna be pumped that you came to church today, how much happier is she gonna be when you tell her I came for five weeks? Like she's gonna call her whole prayer chain and they're all gonna have a potluck because of you. And you can thank me for it. Give me four weeks because we're gonna talk about some of these practical where the rubber meets the road things like how can it be this but that? What is the Bible anyway? Isn't it a bunch of people who wrote stuff down and there's all these contradictions and, and inaccuracies, but it's supposed to be the divine revelation of God. Aren't you all pulling the wool over your own eyes? Maybe, we're gonna talk about that. Give me four weeks. How can I live in a world of advanced degrees and be expected to believe that a snake talked to a dude after a woman ate an apple, right? We're gonna talk about that. I don't have a clue, but George is going to explain it to you next week. <laughs> As a matter of fact, 
He said God gave him a special revelation on the talking snake. So, or you could just ask him afterward. He was hoping to spend this afternoon, you know, with a little. So would you give us four weeks? Would you come back? And then, you know what? Jesus said, taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, taste. And if it's not, if he's not good to you, I don't take offense to that. Or if you're like, yeah, he's good, but I don't really like you very much. I'm okay with that. Like, I'm, I'm okay with myself. You, you know, I hope you find a place that is. But would you come back? And then the second invitation is this. Would you let Jesus make you new? Would you let Jesus make you new? He said, behold, I'm making all things new. This is the glory of his resurrection. Not just, hey, congrats, Jesus. But what Jesus' resurrection means for you and me, for our creation. God's not getting ready to airlift us out of this world. The hope isn't that you get to play a harp on clouds with cherubim for eternity. It's that God restores all things. And listen, he wants to restore you. You're like, but you have no idea what I've done. Yes, but Jesus Christ paid the price for all of it. You're like, yeah, but it would take me a while, like weeks probably, take me the whole four weeks just to get myself back up to a buildable ground zero. You know, God can't steer parked cars, I think what I, the Bible says. Well, no, actually, it, God can steer a car that's broken and won't start. He'll meet you right where you are. You're like, but you don't know what's been done to me. It's true, but every iniquity Every withdrawal, every failure, every letdown from your parents, from hurt people who are hurting you, from the church. I'm so sorry if you've been to church and it's been hurtful to you. People have hurt you in the name of Jesus. That ought not to be. We're all kind of working this thing out, two steps forward and one step back. But Jesus will make that new. He's come to put all things to rights. His resurrection was the first installment. And the God who resurrected Jesus is resurrecting this world. He'll resurrect you. Would you let Jesus make you new? If you would stand up with me, I just want to pray for you. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for your faithfulness and your love. Thank you for your mercy and compassion. It knows no end, no limits. We didn't earn it. We can't possibly, we don't deserve it, and we never will. But thank you that you've done for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. We want a new start. Some of us, we really need it. Friends, as we prepare to close our time together, if you would just keep your heads bowed in reverence to God and your eyes closed, just respecting one another in this tender moment. I think some of us need to come home. We need to come home to God. Some of us would say, if it's true, it sounds too good to be true, but if it's true, I want a fresh start. You mean I can start again? I'm not in plan B for my life. God will meet you where you are. And plan A begins. He's loved you with an everlasting love. And the Bible says that he stands at the door of your heart and knocks. It's kind of funny because he, he made the door. He thought of your heart. But he stands respectfully outside. And if you'll open the door and let him in, he'll come in and dine with you. He'll change your life. And some of us just need to say, yes, Jesus, restore me. I need resurrection. Jesus, make me new. And if that's you, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if that's you, would you just put your hand in the air? We're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to drag you out of your seat or make a show out of you. You can stay right where you are. I just want to pray for you. Okay, I see you. I see all over the room. I see you. We'll wait for you. Some of us need to come home this morning. This can indeed be your resurrection day. You get a fresh start. God will make all things new. Some of us have known him, but from afar, we've gone through the motions, but our hearts have been going in a different direction, and we need to come home. You can start again. We'll wait for you. Anyone else? All over the room, hands in the air. Anyone else? I just want to pray for you right where you are. And thank you. What an important decision you're making. All right, can we pray this together? Tell you what, would you just repeat this after me? Let's all declare this as one, in in one expression of unity and solidarity, whether you're giving your life to Jesus for the very first time or for the first time since Tuesday. um, It's okay to get saved again. Can we all pray this prayer together? Just repeat after me if you would. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. 
with an everlasting love. Jesus Christ, I can't believe you did that for me. I need you to make me new. Would you come into my heart and take control of my life and work out your perfect plans in me? I confess I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. I'm broken and I need you to make me whole. If you're willing to do that, I'm all yours. Friends, the word of God says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So Father, I thank you for my friends. I thank you for the work that you're doing in our world, that you are not angry, you're not waiting to throw a fireball at us, but that you love this place and you love these people and you're making all things new. Would you make us new today? It's in Jesus' name we pray.